Hello, Standard Spirit Club subscribers. Uh, happy to be tasting with you uh, here today. Uh, we are going to go through the four flights starting today with gin, then moving to tequila, then rum, and finishing off with the Amari. So you can go ahead and pop the Amari in the fridge if you'd like, otherwise room temperature is great. Let's begin with gin. Uh, okay, I'll stop, but we will start tasting gin. Um, and we're gonna begin with Malfi. All right, so Malfi is uh, a reference to the Amalfi Coast, uh, and this is gonna be uh, on the Italian coast of Italy, and so it's gonna be uh, right there close to uh, on the French side, Mentone, or the Chicotera on the Italian side, and uh, they're known for uh, world famous for their lemons. And um, this tries to tell the story of uh, monks beginning this uh, uh, production this way, um, uh, uh, right around uh, the turn of the first millennium, right around 1050 AD. Uh, but I wanted to include this one because uh, um, it is uh, supposed to be lemon forward because of its world famousness about the lemons. That has uh, typical gym botanicals. Uh, they focus on uh, uh, what I would consider to be the sort of the main six, but uh, juniper and citrus peel forward uh, with uh, coriander. Uh, uh, let me see what uh, how they do on that. All right, so on the nose, like, absolutely, yeah. Lemon peel all the way. Um, definitely get, like, a little bit of, like, floral with, like, lavender. Juniper's definitely there. Um, tastes almost sweet on the palate, even though, you know, I, I know this is not, like, a back sweetened gin, uh, but I think all that lemon in there, uh, lemon peel, whatever they use uh, to do this, is, is giving it as a really nice, uh, I mean, it's dry, but it has, like, a full-bodied, like, almost, like, perceived sweetness to it because of that um, lemon peel. Yeah, I think this one is uh, is uh, perfect in martinis, negronis. Uh, but uh, one that I like even better uh, is actually escape rate. So I'm going to next. This is New Zealand's uh, a kiwi gin, and uh, this has uh, the high honor of winning best London Dry gin in the world at the London London Dry uh, Spirit Competition. And uh, one of the reasons I want to taste these side by side with you today is because I wanted to show two gins that aim for similar things uh, going about them differently and one sort of super offshoot. Uh, so this one uh, is a London Dry style. Uh, this one I'd say like right around like London Dry uh, with a touch towards New International. This um, is supposed to be straightforward London Dry but with like an extra uh, lemon peel in this. Um, so if we citrus forward, clean water from the New Zealand Southern Alps. Mm. This one also is their premium, or their gold. So uh, this uh, this clocks in. This clocks in right at uh, uh, Navy strength, one fourteen or fifty seven percent alcohol. So I, I uh, on the mouth I, I definitely uh, give this one to be a lot cleaner. Different sort of lemon expression than this. Uh, more juniper forward. Um, almost like a, a, a drier overall experience. Move on to the St. George. This is uh, California. This is uh, San Francisco based. Um, uh, what's really cool about this, I wanted to share it uh, with you, is this, it's their uh, dry ride gin. So um, this has malt in it. Uh, given that they have to still rye, and rye needs uh, malt or at least some sort of enzyme to create that reaction. So um, uh, this is almost like rye white dog, uh, or unaged rye whiskey that then has uh, their signature six botanicals, uh, juniper, lime peel, uh, grapefruit peel, um, malabar, black peppercorn, caraway, coriander. Um, so right away when you smell it, you get that white dog smell. It, it, it smells like being in like a whiskey distillery. And then, then on the back, especially as you like exhale, uh, then those uh, gin botanicals come out. So it's, it's, it's similar to um, almost like that uh, um, Gracia Sadios, like uh, tequila that's been distilled and then they add the gin botanicals. It's like red whiskey. Gymnasium is a much more full body in character. 
closer to the Buffy, but still in its own world for a uh, um, full body character. Uh, the citrus um, is more uh, uh, is almost more noticeable than either of these because of that mouthfeel, and that's uh, what I feel like ties all three of these in because that lime and that grapefruit is a different sort of citrus, but it's almost more present because of that like thick malty mouthfeel to it. Uh, a little bit of spice in there, a little bit of herbs, but all in all, three citrus forward with three sort of different uh, ways of expressing it. Um, cheers! Hope you enjoy them this summer. Da, 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 da. Tequila. So three uh, reposados in front of uh, us today. Uh, three very different reposados. I really wanted to show you uh, uh, how varied or an expression of reposado can be. If you're sitting there like, why do you keep saying that word reposado? I don't know what it means. Reposado is the rested category uh, for aged tequila. Um, so uh, it can be uh, rested uh, just up to uh, 11 months uh, and uh, this one pushes that, uh, this one skirts away from it, uh, but there's three different ideas about the uh, influence of oak on tequila, what they should be, what they could be within a, a reposado. So let's start with La Cretona. Uh, mm. So look at this, uh, 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 the color, I mean, you can see it in your own glass, but especially compared to these other two, this color is going to be a lot lighter. And one of the reasons for it, they, they really try to like, uh, strip the barrel of any of its uh, whiskey influence. Uh, they'll take that, they'll uh, rechar it, and um, they really want the oak influence to be as neutral as possible. And it really comes through. So then that idea of it just being rested in the oak uh, while really maintaining an agave forward um, really works as a female in distillery. When I smell it, I still get a little bit of like oak notes to it. Still like a touch of vanilla, like a touch of almost like cocoa in there. But then the like, uh, uh, the sweet agave notes come through with pepper. So on the mouth, um, on the palate, vanilla comes through a little bit more. Uh, still is pretty downplayed. Uh, definitely just get sort of a smooth robust, but very clean and drinkable agave. Um, I think it really highlights uh, sort of what the flavor of agave can be when it's not uh, overly done with oak, but when it's uh, allowed to like sit and breathe and take on a little bit of oak characteristics, but not too much. Uh, moving on to Corazon. Um, so sort of the heart of the agave plants, the piña is what's um, taken to be distilled. Um, this is six to eight months, uh, rested, uh, single estate. It's now owned by, uh, uh, this used to be a completely different bottle, but this is sort of like a bartender's bottle, uh, so we can use it in our wells better, but uh, you might be more familiar with the different bottle expressions. It's much taller. Um, hmm. You'll notice an immediate difference. Uh, much more oak presence. Um, but here, uh, I get vanilla first with just this sort of like background note of agave. Um, it's very nice to drink, um, very smooth. Black pepper, white pepper doesn't even come into like the exhale. I would say I have much more white pepper than, than black pepper on those. Like touches of um, like herb, like almost like a sage or tarragon in there. Uh, but uh, smooth, drinkable, uh, much more oak presence. Um, but moving on to Casanova, this was uh, 11 months old. It's French oak barrels, it's organic, uh, and also just recently changed bottle style as well. It used to be very different bottle. This is much more bartender friendly as well. So now this uh, stands out completely different than the other. Um, this is almost like an Añejo or an aged bourbon, which gets from like 11, uh, the, the 12 months on to three years. Well, that almost almost tastes like perfumey because that influence of French oak, you get that like that contrast between American oak and French oak as we move forward here. Almost has that like Chardonnay note to it, uh, like a California Chardonnay as it gets in that like uh, uh, a 
different type of vanilla, almost like a Tahitian vanilla bean. But that is one. This is one that you put in a stiffer. It's one that you like, uh, you sip on slowly because it, it, it approaches that feel of like, now you're playing in like a world that's like a lot closer to whiskey. Still get that like really nice, like you can definitely tell it's like beautiful agave, but this is uh, a lot more about the interplay between oak. Uh, so three different uh, same categories, reposados all the way through, uh, but the style of aging and the amount of aging goes up as we go through it. So cheers. All right, so I wanted to kind of throw a treat at you uh, and uh, do not just rum, but scotch in this tasting. And um, I chose three different 15 year expressions. Um, a, uh, a classic space side, a Panamanian, uh, an Eldorado, uh, which is like rum industrial, like Spanish style. Um, kind of wanted to give you an idea of what 15 years means to three different styles of uh, making alcohol. Uh, and show you how how varied also just this amount of aging can be. So, uh, Glen Finnick. Um, this is, uh, uh, in, in Scotland, the rule is, well, 15 year is the youngest whiskey that could be in there. In there, there are some Scotch producers that have played with that. Compass Box did three-year-old Scotch on the label, cost 250 bucks to buy, and there was like a percentage, like 1% three-year Scotch, and then the rest was like 23-year-old, like Kleinlich or something like uh, just because they love to play with like the rules of Scotland and I love uh, their outlaw myths about it. So um, Glenfiddich though, this is a 15 year old, um, so that means the youngest is 15 years, but then it's a Solera style uh, after that. So whatever else they put in the Solera, the youngest juice in there is 15 years old. Um, so that's like a really fun sort of addition to it. Um, and, and generally in Scotland, I mean, 15 years is going to be a lot lighter in color. Bourbon, especially than rum, but Scott, Scotland also has a law that you can add up to like something like 1.5% or something, a small amount of like caramel color to give, uh, to give the appearance of it being older because primarily that's what Americans uh, came to expect with older bourbon. So Scotland tried to match it with caramel color addition. Okay, so smelling it. Unique for scotch, this is going to have uh, an abnormal amount of fruit. For me, this kind of tastes like um, uh, taking a piece of toast and spreading like a uh, some sort of like berry marmalade on there and then putting honey on top of that. Um, warm it all up in the sun. And on the palate, for a scotch, it's abnormally sweet. Um, you can definitely still taste all the malt in there, uh, but then it comes at you with uh, with stone fruit, with berry, with honey. Uh, oh, a very pleasant, very easy to drink. Um, probably more expensive than a standard spirit club should have, but uh, hey, it's summer, we should all celebrate, right? So uh, moving on to uh, this uh, Ronda Panama, the Panama Pacific 15-year uh, aged rum, aged in American oak. Um, now, uh, this also has, uh, 15 year being the youngest thing in it, could be a hundred years old, most likely not. Um, all right, so this is all, um, massive. 200 liter uh, oak casks. They're 53 gallon. This is all molasses based. It's all about the way they distill it, right? Molasses based rum, especially in Panama, can look almost like black strap like. But this is light in color. This is Distilled well. I don't uh, smell let's say like off notes and esters that would tell me that they didn't cut the heads and tails. This is uniquely, I feel like, for a 15 year uh, Panamanian rum, this is going to be, I feel like, uniquely clean, um, easily sippable, easily cocktailable. It's actually going in a, uh, a summer cocktail of ours that's going to be like a, a uh, corn and oil uh, variant. 
Uh, so look for that on the menu. Um, moving on to El Eldorado 15 year. Now this one, uh, this one they actually do back sweeten. Um, Eldorado has been one of my favorite brands for over a decade. Uh, recently uh, disclosed that they uh, do uh, sort of back sweeten it to give it like a nice uh, richer flavor and like no shade on that. You know, they can do whatever they want and it tastes delicious. Um, but for me right away when you smell it, now this has got like coffee, vanilla. This is like bordering on Kahlua. And the taste is, is sweet, it's smooth, it, it's got those like Kahlua notes to it. So uh, this has, even the color is, is much, much darker. This is almost what I had came to expect from an older distilled product, uh, especially rum. Uh, this is sort of about where I live now in expectation. Uh, and this breaks the mold for me for a uh, 15 year old Scott. So, um, this I would drink any day of the week when it's like 10 p.m. Like, this is my after dinner rum. This is my, I could drink this any time of the day. And this is probably an after dinner scotch for me. So three different 15 year old professions. I mm hope -hmm. you enjoyed them. Amaro, uh, the category that kind of means bitter uh, in Italian, but um, the actual uh, reality of it is that they have bitterness in there and they're bitter and something else. So they are. They all express different uh, ways of enjoying a digestivo. Uh, and we are looking at three that, in my opinion, are three of the best for summer consumption. So we're starting off with very, very just light. This is one of the few wine-based Amari out there. Um, and then uh, cardamom does not mean uh, an Amaro with um, uh, cardamom, but it's uh, Amaro with cardoon. So blessed thistle. One of my favorite things to mix with, light, easy, nicely bitter. One of my favorite, uh, honestly, if, if, if it's like a hot summer afternoon, you pour that over ice, you put an orange peel in it, like there it is. That is like uh, um, perfect for a post-lunch afternoon uh, treat on your screen in the patio. Uh, not saying I have personal experience with that, but I do. Uh, Amaro Montenegro. Uh, this is uh, for me sort of an outlier in, in Amari. Uh, even though all three of these are unique in their own right, this is uh, probably the most uh, perfume driven. It's got uh, like strong aromatic notes. There's 40 botanicals in here. But when you smell it, there's like instantly this thing that reminds me of like my grandma's perfume uh, growing up. But uh, super pleasant. The experience of drinking it is actually not that uh, sweet. There is sweetness in there, but it's nicely balanced between sweet and bitter, which makes it also really good to cocktail with, mix it, especially with some of my mezcal. The proof here. So this one clocks in at 23% alcohol. This one comes in a little bit lower. Uh, double check it. Uh, I believe this clocks in right around like 16% alcohol, or 17% alcohol. Uh, Braulio, when we get up there, now this is the most intense of the three. But what I love about it for summer, uh, this is an Alpine based, uh, or an Alpine Amaro. Uh, and it's characteristic of Alpine Amaro in that like you've got berries, like blueberries, blackberries, and smoke on the palate. Um, So if you've gone through the progression with me, you've noticed that um, uh, Braulio, the intensity, not just in flavor and richness, but also in bitterness, and also in alcohol, whoops, comes through. So this one uh, uh, clocks in at 21%, 42 proof. But I think represents such a unique style because it's in the mountains, but that like that presence of both smoke and berries like uh, is reminiscent of like summertime cuisine in the Chicago area. One of the reasons I love this so much for this season. So um, I hope you've enjoyed this journey through. I hope the um, Amari have uh, calmed down your stomach because that's their goal. Uh, and I hope you've enjoyed this uh, Spirit Club membership this, uh, this month and we hope to see you next month. Cheers. Yeah.